Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the Next Society and Himbana's webinar on donor milk advocacy. This webinar is dedicated to sweet baby McKenna, who you see here. And McKenna's mother is going to be sharing her story in uh, a few moments. Um, but I just wanted to highlight our partners for this webinar. Um, we're grateful to the Human Milk Banking Association of North America for joining us and partnering with us on the presentation of this webinar. And we're grateful to Engage, Grow, Thrive for their partnership in our summer webinar series. So again, welcome and thank you to um, everyone for being here uh, to hear about donor milk advocacy. I'm going to advance to the next slide because we have a lot to cover. So for anyone who is just getting to know the Next Society, welcome and thank you for being here. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's dedicated to building a world without neck. And we work on advancing neck research, education, and advocacy. We bring together patient families, clinicians, and other diverse stakeholders um, uh, to prevent neck and improve outcomes for our most vulnerable babies. And these photos are from our 2019 Next Symposium before the pandemic, and we look forward to seeing everyone in person uh, at our next in-person conference. It'll be great. So um, I hope Lindsay will be able to share a link in the chat box um, that highlights the NECA virtual sessions that we hosted back in May when it was NECA Awareness Month. Um, we have an overview of the content that we shared on our website. There's a really nice highlight video, um, some recordings of the pre presentations that took place. Um, so thanks to Lindsay for um, sharing that link. And I hope you all will check out, especially the highlight video. It's just a short video that um, captures what some of the presentations and uh, participants who joined us during the NEC virtual sessions. So I really love this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I think it really highlights the importance of advocacy work and demonstrates how each of us um, has a role to play in building a world without this devastating disease and how we can all contribute to uh, preventing neck and improving outcomes for all babies who are at risk of this really devastating intestinal disease. So we're going to um, do a live poll. So Lindsay is gonna share a link in the chat box. And if you click on that link, it should take you to this question. And that's how you respond. So you click the link and then you're able to um, type in your response. So how many US states provide full coverage of donor milk? And that is inclusive of inpatient and outpatient and all babies who may not have adequate access to the mother's own milk and need, um, need pasteurized donor milk. How many states? I would love for it to be all 50, but it looks like many of you know that it's not all 50. So we'll give this a minute. All right, and I'm gonna advance to the next slide in a moment, but it seems as you all know, many of you know that it is zero. There are not any states that provide full coverage of donor milk at this time. And that's why our work here is so important. I'm gonna advance to the next slide, another life poll question. So if you need to click the link again, you can. Are you or have you ever been connected with your regional milk bank? Um, if you're a clinician, perhaps you've connected with them on ordering donor milk. If you're um, a patient family or a mother, perhaps you've donated your milk or um, any type of relationship that you may have had with your regional milk bank. And I'm sure um, our Himbana partners who are here today will tell you how many milk banks we have in North America. I know there are many. Um, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I know they'll be able to tell you. I'm going to advance to the next slide. The next question is going to take a little bit um, longer to, to answer. So if you can type in your response to this, then it'll show up as a scrolling um, grid. What are the perceived barriers to donor milk use? Um, so if you're a clinician, what have you seen? So cost. Um, if you're a patient family, what are the barriers to perhaps having your baby receive donor milk? Let's see, three answers of cost. <laughs> eligibility, cost and insurance, ID concerns and cost. Give this another second for anyone who's trying to answer, lack of awareness, lack of resources, education. Yeah, I know that um, when my babies were in the NICU, uh, I had never even heard of pasteurized donor milk when they were first admitted. So it was a very new concept. 
for me as a mother when I uh, entered the NICU. All right, I'm gonna advance to the next slide. So here are your speakers for today. Um, for anyone that I've not had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Jennifer Cambisser. I'm the founder and the executive director of the Next Society. I lost my son, Micah, to complications of necrotized enterocolitis. Um, and then Amina is uh, serves on the Next Society Board of Directors, and she's going to be sharing her family's story. Contina is going to give us an overview on health equity and why equitable access to human milk is so important. Allison will be providing an overview of advocacy efforts. Um, Emily is going to talk to us about specific state examples around donor milk. And Denise is going to give us a presentation on donor milk coverage in the different states, specifically uh, for next survivors and outpatient access to donor milk. And then Lindsay and I are going to give a short presentation on engagement opportunities and ways that other people can help us advocate for equitable access to donor milk. And then we're really excited to have Shuttle here who will help us moderate and, uh, and do a Q&A and discussion session with us. So just a quick disclaimer before I hand it over to Amina, the Next Society and our faculty are not providing medical advice and everyone's views are independent from the Next Society as an organization. So I'm gonna hand it over to Amina. Good morning, give me a moment to share my screen. My name is Amina Nebane, and I am a wife, a mother of four. I'm an attorney, soon to be licensed in two states, and I am a member of the Next Society Board of Directors. This is a picture of uh, my family and our time in the NICU with McKenna. This is my sweet little baby McKenna. She was born prematurely at 35 weeks and one day. She had a genetic difference and a congenital heart condition. So we were very focused on her cardiac difference. She loved getting her feet tickled and she loved squeezing my finger. She would not squeeze daddy's finger, but she really enjoyed squeezing my finger. And she had the cutest little baby cry. So McKenna was diagnosed with necrotizing enterocolitis at one week, one, like one and a half weeks old. As you can see in the picture to the left, uh, she was really, really sick very quickly. She was very inflamed and she eventually had to have surgery. And initially after surgery, she was doing very well, but ultimately and unfortunately, she passed away at seven and a half weeks. So just to go back a little bit and give you um, some information about our journey with donor milk. I had a cesarean, so this was my third C-section at the time and I needed to stay in the hospital for a few days. So McKenna was actually airlifted to Children's Hospital of Omaha, which was about five miles from the hospital where I delivered. Um, and here, this is right before she left, I was able to birth her and say goodbye, essentially spend a few minutes with her while I was in the recovery room. So this is how I connected with my daughter the first few days of her life. I was constantly looking at the NICU camera of her, and this is how I took pictures of her those first few days. And while I was in the hospital, I started pumping, and I pumped a lot. And um, what I would do is I would pump and then I had a cholesterol and I put it on like a Q-tip, um, put it in a baggie and they would send it over to Children's Hospital and um, swap her mouth with the little droplets of breast milk that I had those first few days. And I remember when I was in the hospital bed getting a call from a nurse from Children's Hospital. And this was my first time hearing about donor milk. She asked me if I would be willing to give McKenna donor milk because she was on TPN and they didn't want to continue giving her TPN for too long. So I remember my first thought was donor milk. Like, what is that? Ew, I don't want my baby receiving somebody else's milk. So the nurse, um, she spent a few minutes educating me on what donor milk is and the benefits. And I told her 
okay, let me do some research, give me some time and I will get back to you. So in the meantime, right there in my hospital bed, I started researching donor milk and um, I became aware of all the benefits of donor milk. So I remember calling the nurse back and telling her that I was willing to give McKenna donor milk because I believe that was better for her than uh, receiving TPN while I was waiting for my milk to come in. So I continued pumping um, even in the hospital and my milk actually did come in before they were able to give her donor milk. So I was very happy about that. And I pumped around the clock. I pumped at home, at the hospital, at her bedside. And this was um, one of the first times that I was able to hold my baby. Even when McKenna was really sick, after she was diagnosed with neck, I continued to pump. And um, you can see here in the picture to the left that I was pumping at her bedside with my husband. And this was a time she was very sick. And I can tell because um, of what the, the cover that the nurse has on. Um, she had an infection at that time. So everyone was being very careful. Um, but even still, even though she wasn't receiving any type of milk, donor milk or um, breast milk from me, I still continue to pump because I believe that she would get better. And she would eventually be able to have my milk again. So to the right, you can see, um, this is maybe one, one or two days worth of milk that I pumped. Um, and I just kept pumping. I felt like that was really all that I could do. I couldn't, you know, take the pain away from her or cure her from neck, but pumping was one thing that I could do. So I kept doing that. And um, eventually, as I mentioned before, McKenna passed away. And I remember um, a lactation consultant who I developed a relationship with. Um, she came to me and uh, mentioned to me that I can donate my milk. And she helped me transition from pumping so much to not pumping at all because McKenna passed away. And um, I remember going through all the steps that I needed to do, the blood tests, the interviews, the paperwork, submitting the paperwork to my doctors. And um, eventually I donated my milk and I remember receiving this email that said, congratulations, you have been accepted as a donor. And when I first received the email, I remember crying. I cried, I was devastated because that milk was supposed to be for McKenna. And I cried, I remember crying for an hour in my bed um, and Eventually, after I stopped crying and I was able to reflect, I felt proud and honored that I was able to give something that was intended for her to another baby that may be suffering from necrotizing enteric colitis, another premature baby, maybe another baby that had a cardiac difference. And then it became a way for me to honor McKenna and to honor her legacy and to share her with others. So this is the email that I received from that lactation consultant, um, just telling me that they were able to give my milk to the milk bank. One other thing that I, I would like to mention, um, when I was pumping, just to give a shout out to all the nurses that helped me to um, get my milk to come in and that helped me to pump so much milk. Um, when I was in the hospital and even in the NICU, the nurses would come and they would wash my pump parts for me. So that made it a lot easier to just pump. I remember when I was in the hospital recovering from my C-section, they would come in every two hours as I requested, even in the middle of the night, to encourage me to pump. And that's really how my milk came in so quickly. 
So the nurses, you really have a, um, a major impact on um, mothers successfully pumping milk. Thank you everyone for your time and listening and allowing me to share McKenna's story. Thank you, Amina. That was beautiful and devastating and impactful and inspiring and moving. So thank you for being part of the next society and for all that you're doing to honor McKenna and share her story and help babies just like her. So we're going to move over to Cantina, who's going to share um, her slides and give us an overview on health equity and why equitable access to donor milk is so important. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, uh, everyone. My name is um, Cantina Washington Lee Part, and I am the health equity project manager for Himbana. Um, I am uh, happy to be here and to share a little bit about um, the, some of the work that we're doing as it relates to equity and donor milk access. Um, and thank you, Amina, for sharing your story and sharing about your baby. Um, one of the things that we know in the work that we're doing as it relates to looking at barriers to equity is that storytelling is so important and having first person um, conversations with people about their experiences with donor milk, um, both as donors or as recipients or folks who didn't even know like Amina said, that donor milk was an option um, and were educated about it and then ultimately became both a recipient um, and a donor is so important um, to this work. So thank you for, for sharing that. Let me get my screen to move here. One second. Okay. So one of the questions um, that kind of guides the work that we're doing as it relates to this health equity task force, which I'm going to share a little bit about uh, later on, is what is our why? I think that's the question that all of us should be asking as we do this work. Um, what is, is our why? Um, why are we passionate about this? Um, where, where, where do we enter this space um, from? Um, I uh, did not include a slide about my background, but I'm a mom. My daughter is 14 now, so it's been quite a while uh, since I was um, nursing her, but I did nurse her for 13 months. Um, I was trained as a breastfeeding, breastfeeding uh, peer educator, and I worked for um, a number of years as a healthcare chaplain, including in the NICU. Um, so I have uh, walked alongside many, many families, many mothers um, who are experiencing um, the terrifying uh, experience that it is to have a baby who is sick and who is in the NICU. Um, and as Amina said, feeling powerless, feeling helpless um, to be able to do anything to help your baby feel better or to get better. So the why um, are the babies? The why are the moms who um, and families, um, birthing parents who deserve to have access to all of the information um, in order to make um, informed decisions about the care um, of, their, of their children. And so these are just a few pictures of um, moms and babies of various um, ethnic and racial backgrounds that um, unfortunately have been historically, um, have experienced historic uh, disparities as it relates to um, access to donor milk, awareness about donor milk. And these are, um, these pictures, these photos represent um, many of the communities that we um, will be working with um, and folks who are on our task force that represent uh, these communities to um, figure out a roadmap to ensure equity um, in donor milk access, human donor milk access. So the question of equity, what do we mean when we, uh, when, when we say equity? Um, and so I, th I think that question gets thrown around, or I'm sorry, that statement, that word gets thrown around a lot. And so one of the um, tools that I use when I'm talking about equity um, is this, um, this, these questions. Um, this uh, professor that's uh, pictured here is a very uh, close friend of mine, Dr. D.L. Stewart. Um, who wrote an article a few years ago as it related to diversity and equity within higher education spaces. But um, the uh, article went viral. Lots of people were talking about it, um, particularly when we think about the ways that DEI is kind of in the forefront right now in so many organizational spaces. And so um, the question here is, you know, what, what, does, what are the questions that we need to be asking when we're thinking about equity? And what do we mean when we say equity? Um, and so one of the, the um, most important things to think about 
is the response of who's in the room if, if diversity is asking that question and equity is responding, who's trying to get in the room and can't, um, whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure and what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as a perpetual majority? And so these are the questions that myself and the folks who sit on our task force at Hibana, um, both internally and externally, um, and or in the organization as a whole, are, are continuing to ask and hoping to answer as we um, try to uncover uh, the reasons why there is uh, healthcare inequity is, as it relates to donor milk access and what we might um, contribute to doing something about that. So access to donor human milk um, is a, a reproductive justice concern. Um, and so for those who, um, you know, m m lots of people are familiar with what reproductive rights are, what reproductive health is, but reproductive justice as a framework, um, I think it's important to define that here um, because that is the um, way that I'm entering this work as someone who's worked in the reproductive justice arena for um, several years. Um, it's how I am in the world as a parent, as a woman, as a black woman. Um, and, um, and so this is what colors the way that I think about um, access in general. So reproductive justice means the human right to control our sexuality, our gender, our work, and our reproduction. Um, that right can only be achieved when, our, um, when all women and girls have the complete economic, social, and political power and resources to make healthy decisions about our bodies, our families, and our communities. So access, obviously, is, is very important to that. If I don't have all of the information, if I show up in a hospital space and no one tells me um, that donor milk is an option or I... Um, they assume that I wouldn't want donor milk for my baby, or they assume that I'm not going to nurse, or they assume whatever um, things that they may assume about me, that acts as a barrier to my being able to have all the information that I need to make informed decisions about myself and, and my, ch my child's uh, life. So Hambana has always had an organizational commitment, and we're really grateful that um, last year the uh, Kellogg Foundation um, gave us some resources, additional resources to be able to do some more targeted work as it relates to that. Um, and so Lindsay, who you're going to hear from later on in um, the webinar today is our executive director. Um, and this quote is what um, one of the things that she said um, after the announcement of the Kellogg grant. Um, and so by growing and diversifying our base of milk donors and receivers, we'll seek to reduce infant morbidity and mortality in the U.S. while addressing structural racial inequalities and disparities inequities and the disparities in the usage of pasteurized donor human milk. Um, it's our duty as an organization to eliminate racial disparities in access. Um, and so again, this is a reproductive justice um, commitment and um, I'm really grateful to be working for an organization that takes this seriously and is putting the resources and the people um, behind that to, to get this work done. So um, last or earlier this year, um, the uh, Hambana uh, conducted an internal field scan. Um, uh, we uh, looked at um, and interviewed our milk banks, the majority of the milk banks, um, and a few of the major uh, findings that came out of that um, internal field scan was one that data collection lacked uniformity uh, related to demographics. So there's very little to no information um, in a lot of our, most of our milk banks as it relates to the demographics. So we don't know who's receiving the milk and we don't know who's getting the milk. And so that is a huge um, challenge um, because it makes the analysis difficult as to um, what's happening um, when, when we are receiving milk um, and what's happening when that milk is going out. Um, a majority of milk banks collect no data from the hospitals on the recipients of donor milk. So again, um, a lack of information um, in terms of, of the dissemination. Um, there is, on a, on a good front, there is some equity work already happening in, in many of our member milk banks, including sliding scale fees for families that uh, may need that, racial diversity, and digital print materials, and multilingual staff. And so those are um, positives that came out of that field scan that there is some work that's already um, already happening. So um, what that means and what I'm doing, a large part of my everyday job um, is to um, uh, facilitate, um, to, was to convene and now facilitate this donor milk health equity task force. 
Um, so we have um, 10 members, which includes um, two Hambana board members, um, as well as our um, outside consultant. And Lindsay also um, participates in, in our meetings and gatherings as well. Most of the members are, are um, identified as Black, um, Indigenous or Native, um, or non-Black people of color. Um, and so that is obviously um, a, was intentional and is really um, helpful in terms of um, not only just looking at the disparities, but also having um, some particular insight into these communities uh, where we find that there is a lack of access or um, barriers to access. Um, the members represent a wide variety of vocational backgrounds. And so we have folks in public health, academics, uh, clinical, religious, and grassroots setting um, on the religious um, Tip, I will say that we um, do have a member uh, of our task force this year who is um, a Muslim woman and who does a lot of research work related to um, uh, what it looks like to be a Muslim person, a Muslim woman and need donor milk for your baby because there are some religious um, nuances and, and, and that come along with that, even within theological diversity within the Muslim community. And so we're really grateful to have her. And we meet bi-monthly virtually, hopefully we'll be able to meet in person um, later as it becomes safer. Um, and so we actually just had a really great meeting yesterday um, with, with our folks, our second meeting. Um, and so we're right on target uh, with our work. So one of the things that we did last night um, as I wrap up here is to think about some questions. We're always asking questions. What are we considering? Um, or what do we need to be considering when we're evaluating equity in donor human milk access? And so the question last night that we um, pondered on together as a group for about an hour was how we experience and understand barriers to equitable distribution of donor milk. So in our communities, within healthcare, public education, et cetera. And one of the, the huge takeaways that we found is that um, Amina shared in her um, narrative that she didn't even know about donor milk and her immediate um, knee jerk reaction was, oh, you know, that I'm not sure somebody get having my baby having somebody else's milk, which is a very natural and normal reaction that a lot of people have. And then her mind was able to be changed with more information with a nurse who took the time to educate her about what donor human milk is, about how it's safe, about what impact it can have on your baby. And just in our conversation last night that I'll share, we had a wide variety of experiences from our folks who work in clinical settings where we had nurses um, or their, their observation of nurses who were very interested in educating folks about donor human milk um, and not making assumptions based upon somebody's racial ethnic background um, that they would or would not be interested in um, nursing or in donor human milk. And then we had folks um, on the other end of the spectrum who never even approached the topic at all and just pushed formula or just presumed people wouldn't be interested. So that's a huge, and that's on the, cl the clinician side. Um, so that's a huge um, disparity that we will continue to be doing some work around. So um, as I wrap up, educational campaigns, knowledge products, those will be our tangibles that we hope to um, create coming out of, out of this research and out of this um, uh, convening that we're doing. And uh, that is the end of my presentation. And I look forward to answering any questions um, that folks have at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Jen and the Next Society and Lindsay and Hambana. Um, for allowing me to talk to y'all today. My name is Allison Rose and I'm a neonatologist in Atlanta, Georgia with Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And I just wanna thank all of the patient families, Amina specifically, and the collaborators who are here today working to build a world without neck. Um, just in terms of disclosures, the American, American Academy of Pediatrics section on neonatal perinatal medicine has generously provided a grant to the Georgia chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics for our work on advocacy efforts in the state. So I appreciate their support. The vision and the goal of the next society is to build a world without neck. One really key step on the way to achieving this goal is to optimize the nutrition of infants at risk for neck. Providing human milk is one of the very few strategies that we actually have that decreases the chances a baby's going to get neck. And if a baby does not have access to maternal milk, she or he needs donor human milk. Thus to build a world without neck, 
we need to provide access to donor human milk to every high-risk infant, regardless of geography or ability to pay. In 2011, the U.S. Surgeon General released its call to action to support breastfeeding. And in 2017, the American Academy of Pediatrics reinforced prior policy statements that called for the use of donor milk in high-risk infants. Both organizations issued a call to action to identify and address obstacles to greater availability of safety ba safely banked donor milk. They also called for an examination of current payment models, including both WIC and health insurance programs to explore ways to increase access. As the AAP states, the use of donor human milk in appropriate high-risk infants should not be limited by an individual's ability to pay. Policies are needed to provide high-risk infants access to donor milk on the basis of documented medical necessity and not financial status. Katina really in a lovely way talked about um, several of the barriers to access to donor human milk. I'm gonna focus on two um, as they sort of relate to conversations with policymakers. Um, and so the first one is, is knowledge. Um, one of the most sort of significant barriers and also one that can be affected by many groups, including patient families and neonatal caregivers and institutions is, is knowledge. Sort of the, the basic knowledge that donor human milk reduces the risk of neck and that it can save lives in the most high risk infants um, is a core piece of understanding um, that we need to be able to disseminate to parents and to policymakers. Uh, we have to be able to explain the value of donor human milk to different stakeholders in language that's clear if we want them to understand its importance. Uh, Jen and Lindsay are going to talk about some specific ways to engage the community as well as ways to educate the community on donor milk. So I'm going to focus a little bit about um, sort of educating and, and talking to policymakers. Um, over the past 10 to 20 years, our understanding of the importance of donor milk has grown tremendously. This knowledge growth is emphasized here in this sort of very simple accounting of research papers published over the past 20 years. From 2000 to 2010, there were 220 publications in PubMed related to donor human milk, and that number increased fourfold from 2011 to 2021. So the medical knowledge and the medical evidence continues to grow, but that knowledge needs to get passed on to families and to policymakers. As a neonatologist, this is where I go to find information. I go to PubMed, I search the literature and try to sort of distill out from all of these research papers, what are best practices for the NICU? But this actually is not a very useful form of knowledge for policymakers. And so as advocates um, in the medical field, part of our job is to take this information and reformat it and refine it and present what was developed over years and years of research and thousands of papers of grant writing and paper writing um, into a, a powerful story or an, into a single page of information. Just as important or if not more important than the details of research is the personal story. Um, like we heard about McKenna this morning, um, that's more powerful than anything I could say as, as a neonatologist. Um, and it's also important for policymakers to hear those stories. Um, they're not usually healthcare workers, they're mothers and fathers, they're sons and daughters though, and grandparents. And so they can relate to a story. And I'm guessing everyone on this webinar has a story to tell. The story is really important, but in addition, the policymakers are gonna want an understanding of evidence and efficacy of the treatment that we're asking for. Um, and this was when it's time to present all of those sort of research articles in a very clear and concise way. On the right is just a sample one page info sheet um, that outlines the argument for Medicaid coverage for donor milk that could be used by advocates when talking with policymakers. In one page, it attempts to explain prematurity, donor milk, NEC, and then the morbidity and mortality associated with it. So it's a lot to talk about. As you're trying to organize your advocacy ask, you can think about outlining your cause um, by framing it very simply as what is the main issue? What is your request and being very specific about this? Why it matters to your community and being specific about your state or the community that you are trying to engage as well as cost. And that's gonna bring me to the second barrier that I'm gonna talk about in detail, um, which is um, cost as a barrier to access to donor human milk. 
Unfortunately, unequal access to healthy nutrition is nothing new in our country. One in seven children in the U.S. actually live in a household with food insecurity. So the mental mindset that nutrition can provide or can promote health and prevent disease and is therefore worthy of significant public investment is already at a disadvantage in our country. To make donor milk widely accessible, it needs to be adequately paid for by Medicaid and private insurance. And we know from studies from Meg Parker and others that hospitals that serve a primarily Medicaid population are less likely to offer donor milk to its patients. These safety net hospitals, both rural and urban, have fewer resources and more financial pressures, which may push pain for donor milk lower on their priority list. Sometimes even if donor milk is covered as a benefit for a family, it may be, that benefit may be set up in such a way that a family has to pay out of pocket up front and then await reimbursement. Um, these initial costs may be several thousands of dollars and thus out of reach for most people. So even if donor milk is technically covered as a benefit, if it's not available to those who cannot incur that initial cost, the benefit's really not there. So in addition to providing insurance coverage for donor milk, payers need to do so in a way that works for patient families. Just like the story of NEC and the importance of donor milk is key to advocacy, so is discussing cost with policymakers. I'm a neonatologist, I am not an accountant, I'm not a banker, I don't really enjoy talking about money. Um, but it is an important point and one that does need to be discussed. And the good thing about donor milk is that it is cost savings um, in terms of, of how much it costs as well, or at the, the worst cost neutral for a state. So this is a sample cost analysis similar to what was used by advocates in New York State in 2017 um, when they successfully passed legislation to cover donor milk for infants less than 1500 grams. Again, in one page and very simply, they were able to show that the cost of donor milk coverage and thus the reduced cases of neck would be cost savings to the state. Knowledge and payment are just two hurdles to jump. There's lots of other ones, um, including the ones that Kentina already talked about. Um, however, despite all of these variable, these um, obstacles, um, there's been great progress um, across the country um, in terms of access to donor milk. California was the first state to cover donor milk back in 1998, um, but in the past three years, seven additional states have added some form of donor milk coverage or regulation to the policies. And Dr. Miller in the next section is gonna highlight some of these specific state efforts. These policies, however, do not catch every baby. Some may only cover outpatient infants or others may only provide milk until three months of age. Others may require repeat formula feeding trials. Thus many babies slip through the cracks. This graph shows the percent of high risk infants born in a state with some form of donor milk policy or legislation. As I mentioned in the previous slide, that policy may be limited in scope. So I would argue that this is an overestimation of the number of infants who are covered. But if we just look at the numbers that they're most optimistic, in 2019, about 35% of high-risk infants were born in a state where that state had worked to provide access to donor milk. So there's lots of work to do. And there's also lots of ways to get involved. I know Lindsay has been putting links to the Next Society and to Himbana in the chat box. Another wonderful resource is the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's a strong organization that advocates for children across many different health issues, and they have committees that are very specific to advocacy and to breastfeeding um, and to newborns. And then if you're looking to advocate on a state level, reaching out to your state legislature and developing a relationship with them is really key. Many chambers actually aren't in session right now, so it's a great time to reach out. So with that, I'm just going to remind us of our goal um, that we are working to build a world without neck and that we are working to provide access to donor human milk to every high-risk infant, regardless of the ability to pay. Thanks so much. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Miller. Hi, my name is Emily Miller. I am a neonatologist and a passionate donor milk advocate at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Thank you so much to the Next Society for this opportunity to talk about donor milk advocacy and how we can utilize policy to increase access to donor human milk and improve health outcomes for our high-risk infants. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, I have no disclosures, but um, two things I want to say before we get started. Um, as we start to discuss the framework for uh, access to general human milk, I do believe in healthcare for all Americans when and where they need it. And I also think it's really important to talk about building networks and not walls as we talk about advocacy. Um, so I want to ground us all first in some terminology and provide us a framework to talk about how states have approached gender milk advocacy in their area. In the United States, public policy includes the laws, regulatory measures, and funding priorities concerning a given topic. So individuals and groups can shape public policy through education and advocacy at any of these points. Advocacy groups can educate the general public as well as policymakers about the nature of problems, legislation needed to address those problems, and the funding required to provide services or conduct research. When we apply this framework to donor milk, you can start to imagine the many ways that public policy can influence how families access donor milk, both positively and negatively. Policy change at all levels, local, state, or national, is the most effective way to improve the health of populations, and we all play such an important role in this process. So big P versus little p is a convenient shorthand to distinguish between large and small policy decisions. Comparing big P and little p policies can help us better understand where our efforts can have the most impact across the broad spectrum of donor milk issues and how we can best allocate our time and resources as advocates. Big P refers to state or national policy change. So some examples of these are legislation and executive actions, which require elected officials approval. That might be securing state funding for a milk bank or expanding postpartum Medicaid coverage. Big P policymaking is labor and time intensive. And due to the number of stakeholders, it's often difficult to influence. However, when big P policies are implemented, the implications for change at a systems level can be far reaching, affecting a much larger population than just one agency or jurisdiction. Little P policies are typically at the department or agency level and generally address organizational practices, agency priorities, internal and external distribution of resources and regulations. These types of policy changes can create quick wins and sometimes lead to larger changes that typically are not as labor or time intensive as big P policy changes. There are many examples of impactful change resulting from little P policymaking, like securing Medicaid coverage for gender milk in a state, which can be done through agency level policy change. But since private payers often follow Medicaid's lead, this can lead to a much larger change at the state level and beyond. So let's talk a little bit about the current landscape of donor milk advocacy in the United States. This map describes active provisions for medical coverage of donor milk around the country. And as you can see from the map, some states have none, while other states have multiple pathways. However, every state has different language regarding who qualifies based on medical necessity, and in what care setting. Due to the variety of patient populations that benefit from donor milk, this means that no state has inclusive coverage. As Dr. Rose mentioned, currently only a third of high-risk infants are covered by existing Medicaid or insurance policy, which creates countless access and equity issues. So I'm going to break some of these issues down and talk about state-specific examples that have both positively and negatively impacted donor milk access. So how can regulations influence access to donor milk? Well, state regulations specifically surrounding licensing of milk banks can both positively and negatively impact milk access. For example, California law inadvertently discouraged the feeding of human milk to infants in the hospital by requiring the hospital obtain and maintain a full tissue bank license. So hospitals that couldn't complete that process and get that license couldn't legally store milk on the hospital premises including milk provided by mothers for their own hospitalized infants. This is a clear barrier to human milk use and legislation was passed in 2006 that removed this regulatory restriction. Also in Pennsylvania, the Keystone Mothers Milk Bank Act of 2020 provided basic oversight for all organizations collecting or distributing human milk in that state. This positively impacted donor milk use because it impacted the awareness of donor milk use and more cases of donor milk use are now being covered by insurance. 
Well, what about laws? So some states have taken a legislative approach to gender milk advocacy and have passed laws that require health insurers to cover the cost of gender milk. In 2019, Illinois passed a law requiring health insurance companies to cover the cost of medically necessary donated breast milk and breast milk fortifiers. The definition for medical necessity in this law is broad. So this includes both in hospital and at home use. Because the law mandates that insurance companies cover these products and reimburse hospitals and families, hospitals that specifically serve low income patients can now afford to get milk. And this is an example of how laws can positively influence access and reduce disparities. Another example of increased access to gender milk through legislation is in Arkansas, where a recent law created a state funded milk bank. Prior to this, infants in Arkansas received milk from banks in other states and were subject to issues of limited supply. Since the closest milk bank is in Texas, this also meant that many mothers were participating in informal milk sharing, which isn't regulated and may pose safety issues to vulnerable infants. The infant mortality rate in Arkansas is higher than most other states in the country and creation of a state milk bank increases donor milk availability in a way that is safe for hospitalized infants and improves health outcomes. Finally, we've talked a lot about cost and insurance policy is one of the largest influences on access to donor milk. It can both drive disparity and enable equity. Currently only 14 states have Medicaid or insurance mandates or a coverage provision. Except for the few states with existing legislative mandates, private payer policies do not cover donor milk and many explicitly exclude coverage. There's also the issue of how hospitals are reimbursed for donor milk, because even if an insurance policy provides coverage of donor milk, the policy may not allow the hospital to bill in such a way that it can break even. A recent survey of NICUs in the United States found that 86% of hospitals continue to pay for donor milk from the hospital budget. And these circumstances create a socioeconomic divide, which leads to inequitable access to donor milk and disparities in rates of necrotizing enterocolitis, sepsis, and growth failure. One recent example of a comprehensive donor milk policy is in Louisiana. Louisiana Medicaid covers donor milk in the hospital setting for a variety of medical indications. Reimbursement for donor milk is made separately from the hospital payment for inpatient services, and this provides an incentive for individual hospitals to provide donor milk. A prior authorization is not required to get that reimbursement, and in case a claim is accidentally denied, it's reprocessed without needing any additional action from providers. The policy also had a retroactive effect, which means that they got reimbursement for past donor milk use in the months preceding the policy. States that have adopted inclusive donor milk coverage policies have seen increased use of donor milk, decreased rates of necrotizing enterocolitis, and decreased hospital length of stay and cost for NICU infants. And because cost is a major barrier to donor milk access, funding for research, financial resources for families, and support for ongoing advocacy underlie all of the issues that we've talked about. Increased funding helps reduce barriers to studying human milk. Collecting information on health outcomes improves the evidence base, which supports the use of donor milk. Funding also supports the creation of milk banks, which reduces geographic barriers. And also funding Medicaid coverage supports policies that have already been put in place. Access to donor milk should not depend on the ability to pay. And many milk banks have access to philanthropic support that they can pass on to families to help bridge the gap and provide safe donor milk to babies in need. Finally, donor milk advocacy takes time and energy from initial discussions to final passage of a bill, the process can take years. Many of us volunteer our time and funding can allow passionate advocates to build networks, gain momentum and enact change. So what can we as parents, providers and the net community do? Well, I like the phrase from Stacey Abrams, which is that we can educate, advocate and agitate. As much as we, the neonatal and neck community, understand the value of donor milk, most people are not aware of this treatment. So we need to educate others. We can advocate. Without our advocacy efforts, donor milk is not going to just happen. And that means babies will continue to die. And we can agitate because access to donor milk is an equity issue. 
families that can advocate for themselves, pay out of pocket, have the knowledge to even ask for donor milk will have access to this treatment where others won't. And that is just not acceptable. I believe, I believe that we can make a difference, but it will take all of us working together. So now I'm gonna turn it over to our next speaker who is going to share her unique experience advocating for donor milk. I am the director of Mid-Atlantic Mother's Milk Bank in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We are a nonprofit milk bank that is accredited by Havana that serves Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and areas of surrounding states. Um, I have nothing else to disclose. So um, I want to just, we're switching, you know, a little bit here to talk about another population, which is the outpatients. Um, you know, a lot of the conversation about donor milk is focused on inpatient. There is a massive amount of evidence that we have um, about the efficacy of donor milk to protect um, little ones from neck and from other complications in the NICU and to improve health outcomes. But outpatients are another big need. Um, so outpatients, they are, I'm going to talk a little bit generally about outpatients, and these are kind of shared experiences that were probably common to all Habana milk banks, and then talk a little bit about our experiences specifically with neck survivors. So outpatients are a very unique population. Um, they are very complex. The only commonality that we see in our outpatients is that they have very unique, very complex medical challenges. Um, there's a very small number of infants that will have a medical need for donor milk on an outpatient basis, but for those infants, that need is absolutely critical. And because of the costs, it's unaffordable for most families, for nearly all families, because these babies are very high volume users. Um, unlike, you know, there's a lot of babies in patient that use donor milk, but they're using small sips of it. Our outpatients are using, you know, 20 to 30 ounces per day. And, you know, even more than that, sometimes we get kids who have um, cardiac issues and they have a lot of growth catch up. So they're, they're drinking high volumes of donor milk. So what that translates to is a cost that's, you know, 80 to 135 and beyond um, per day. So unaffordable for uh, the parents themselves and also unaffordable for the milk banks because without insurance coverage, only a fraction of these medical needs are able to be met. And this is something that we learned very quickly um, when we opened our milk bank. Our milk bank's relatively young. Uh, we opened in January of 2016, and we were open only a couple months before we started to realize the enormity of the outpatient need and the access and equity issues that go along with that. Um, we were barely opened a week, and we were getting calls from the Children's Hospital here um, with patients that were coming out of the CICU um, and coming out of the NICU that um, really had exhausted um, all of their nutrition options. And um, we learned very quickly that donor milk can really help out in these situations. Um, so many milk banks like our own do have charitable care programs. Um, our own milk bank offers a 10 to 90% discount for donor milk for uh, uh, babies that have a medical need that are not being fully covered by insurance or if there's gaps in that. However, um, that's not really, you know, sustainable. I can't think of any other, uh, you know, medical intervention um, where it's not covered for, I mean, donor milk is a legitimate um, intervention that has um, documented benefit. Uh, we do not ask uh, people that need an outpatient transfusion to go get charity care from the blood bank for that. I mean, so it's, you know, the same exact thing um, needs to happen for donor milk. So um, that's a little bit about the, the, the outpatients in general. And now I want to talk a little bit about um, what we've been seeing with outpatients and then move specifically on to our next survivors. So the outpatients at Mid-Atlantic Mother's Milk Bank, um, as I mentioned, they have very complex and diverse diagnoses. Um, for our milk bank, um, we're pretty wide open in our policies for outpatients. Um, so they make up 30 to 40% of what we do in our distribution. Uh, we distribute about 25,000 ounces of donor milk per month. We serve 40 hospitals. Um, so primarily our, our milk's going to, of course, the, um, the hospitals. But, um, you know, we're seeing 
dozens of outpatients every month as well. Um, elective use is very minimal, mainly because of costs, of course. Um, when we do see elective use, it's usually small bits of bridge milk. So outpatients that, you know, well babies that have, um, you know, just their moms just aren't making quite enough. And so donor milk is just acting as a bridge until mom um, can build up her supply. But that's very, very small amounts of milk, maybe two or three bottles um, per family. So that's a very small bit of our our distribution. Um, a prescription is required for donor milk. That is um, something that uh, because of Habana accreditation, so Habana milk banks do require a prescription for donor milk. In the state of Pennsylvania, a prescription is required as well. So we are mandated under um, both of those guidelines to have to have a prescription. Um, we are finding that insurance coverage has been improving. Um, that is because since day one, we have been actively working on developing relationships with the state and with the MCOs here in Pennsylvania. And we are seeing it improving with each and every uh, case that we put in front of these insurers. And, you know, insurers are not evil. They have, we have a common goal. Um, insurance plans do well when patients do well. And when we opened our milk bank, it was a very novel service here in Pennsylvania. Uh, believe it or not, in 2013, not a, when we started this project, um, there was not a single NICU in on the western half of Pennsylvania that was using donor milk. Um, and still, when we opened in 2016, um, there still wasn't any uh, any uh, NICUs that were using donor milk here. But within just a few weeks of us opening, we had switched that. Uh, all those NICUs. And within a year, we had 100% of the neonatal intensive care units um, in the state of Pennsylvania using donor milk for their at-risk infants. But that meant that this is completely foreign to a lot of our health plans. So it's really been education and education where we've made that uh, made those strides in getting coverage. So these are two of the outpatients that we have cared for um, over the years. Uh, little Chloe, who had congenital heart disease, and she was on donor milk for, oh gosh, over a year between inpatient and outpatient. She was fully covered. And then Gideon, who has spinal muscular atrophy, he only drinks a tiny bit of uh, donor milk because of for for the fat in it um, per day as part of his um, his nutrition plan. And he's also fully covered as well. So coverage is a lot of times, um, you know, you don't know until you ask. And uh, we've had a lot of families that have also been very active in advocating for coverage for their, their children as well. So now I want to talk a little bit uh, specifically about neck survivors. So we have been working on trying to get the word out about outpatient use, about medically um, necessary evidence-based use. There's not much in the literature. And so we have been collecting data on all the outpatients that we have served in the six years that we have been in existence and uh, tracking their diagnoses, tracking how much donor milk they've used. Um, we do a few forms that we um, have the parents fill out about symptoms and growth, and we have them fill those out again um, uh, as they move along with uh, using donor milk so we can collect some objective um, data about what donor milk is doing for these children. Um, as part of that, we now have an IRB approved um, study that we are working on uh, and we're selecting a few of the cases that we have and going back and interviewing the parents and going over the medical histories, going over chart reviews. And we're hoping to publish this so that we can start um, getting some information out there about evidence-based outpatient use. So as part of that review of looking at all of our outpatients, um, I went back and looked specifically um, at which next survivors we had. So I'm looking at years 2018 to 2019. We had eight infants that had a history of surgical neck um, and the duration of outpatient uh, use for these uh, survivors was two weeks to one year. Um, those that use not that much donor milk, it was, you know, because of cost, usually. Um, the total volume per recipient was somewhere between, you know, barely any um, to over 10,000 ounces. Um, five of those eight recipients received full insurance coverage, yet those eight don't nearly, you know, they don't represent even a small bit of the babies that 
could um, benefit from donor milk in our geographic region. Um, one of those babies was uh, pictured uh, above, little Alice, and he had uh, survived seven bowel resections. Um, he used donor milk for over a year, and donor milk really was credited with how well he um, he was able to do. He really had no um, no luck at all with transitioning onto any other nutrition source, but he was able to graduate onto a regular diet after using donor milk and we were able to get coverage for him. Um, he was featured in a news story on WTAE in Pittsburgh um, a few years ago, so you can look that up. And then lastly, how can you help with um, outpatient um, need and making sure these children get the donor milk that they need? Um, we want you to know the donor milk is an option outside of the hospital setting, so don't be afraid to prescribe it. And if you do prescribe it, be willing to take the extra steps to get coverage. Every preauthorization, every letter of medical necessity, every peer-to-peer -peer review is educating the health plans. There is plenty of milk across the United States. There is absolutely no medical need that Habana milk banks cannot supply that milk for. So it is cost, it is not milk supply that is really creating the equity and access issue. And I do encourage everyone to develop a strong relationship with your regional milk bank and to work with them because I know on our milk bank, we really help with the insurance coverage and you know we, we really try to do everything we can to facilitate that. And then lastly, if you are seeing that um, you have outpatients that are benefiting from donor milk, you know, let the world know that. Publish your data, collect data, um, make sure that that word is getting out there. So um, I will enjoy hearing your questions about outpatient donor milk um, in the discussion, but that's all I have for now. So I will turn it over to the next speaker. Hi everyone, how are you? Hoping you all can hear me and see my slides. You'll let me know if you don't. I have nothing to disclose today. So Cantina started her talk about uh, our why, and this is my why. I found myself nodding and smiling with uh, Amina's story about pumping. This is a picture of me thrust into motherhood with a medically fragile baby here on the left. That's baby Charlotte. She's 11 now and healthy but she was born with some severe complications from a condition called a giant omphalocele where her abdominal organs were outside of her body at birth. So she endured several surgeries and was unable to breastfeed at that time, even though that was what my heart's desire was um, when I thought about becoming a mom. Um, I was also lucky like Amina was where I received tremendous support, most of uh, from which were from nurses. And I was also pumping around the clock and um, I was fortunate to deliver actually at a children's hospital. So I wasn't separated from my baby. I had a short distance from where I was being treated after my C-section down into the NICU. And so all of that pumping, and as you can see, she's intubated here. So she couldn't take, uh, breast milk or, or come to the breast, of course, during all this duration of her surgeries. All the while, you can see the photo on the right was uh, my pumped breast milk. Uh, again, all that pumping around the clock. And she wasn't able to take that until several weeks um, into the, you know, after her birth. So at that time, I also, believe it or not, had never heard about uh, donor milk. And again, it was a nurse um, who many of you probably know and may be on this call. Dr. Diane Spatz was um, one of my nurses and she talked to me about the magical thing called milk donation. So uh, all of this beautiful milk, I had an abundant supply enough to care for my own baby. And I went through the screening process and was able to donate milk. And that was such a wonderful thing it's also something that Amina, um, I really related to you when you said that, you know, you felt like this is the one thing that you could do. And that was also what was pushing me forward as a mom when things were really chaotic and scary and sad. I just kept on pumping and um, thankfully it was help helpful for my child, but also to um, many others through the donation process. So I'm super grateful for that. 
And here I am now, ED, Executive Director at the Human Milk Banking Association of North America, and really grateful to be working with such uh, an organization that has such a great mission and honor my daughter every day and babies um, all over the United States uh, and Canada. So Himbana has been around since 1985, and we have 31 member milk banks, all nonprofit members. The majority are in the U.S., and also three in Canada. And there are numerous depots throughout the US um, where their moms or parents can drop off milk. Um, and the main point of Himbana is to make sure that we are providing milk safely. And we do that through rigorous standards from the process of accepting the milk, as I talked about, being screened as a donor, processing the milk, which you can see here in this photo, and then dispensing the milk, both inpatient, as we talked about, and as Denise just talked about, in outpatient use. So I wanted to show the map of where our member milk banks are located, and there's 31 uh, blue dots here. The other dots are developing milk banks that we hope to come on board by the end of this year. So you may notice that there is not necessarily a milk bank in every state, However, given the way that milk um, can be shipped safely overnight, there is not necessarily a need for a milk bank to be in every state. We are able to cover, I believe as Denise also said, every baby that needs it, geography should not be an issue. Um, milk banks know exactly how to get that milk where it needs to be on time. And wanted to just wrap up I'm being brief today to make sure that we uh, allow for time for Q&A, but threaded throughout everyone's presentation today and starting with the most powerful with Amina's is this idea of personal stories. And that is how we can raise awareness. That is how we can convince lawmakers, uh, legislators to affect change. That is how um, healthcare providers can influence their peers or also educate insurance providers about the benefits of pasteurized donor human milk. Specifically, if you're a family listening right now, you can talk about being a milk donor, just like Amina and I did today. And milk recipients also make for great stories. Parents can tell the story of their baby. And I've recently heard that some of our milk banks that have been around for a while are now bringing on uh, patients who are old enough to speak for themselves about what it meant for them to be a recipient of donor human milk and the life-saving benefits that it provides. So always remember that these personal stories are really what compels people to listen and affect change. So I encourage all of you to tell your story. I know you all have one, whether it's in your own family or someone you know and love. So thank you so much for listening to me today. And we'll have lots of time for Q&A afterwards. You can put them in the chat and um, we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to do a quick presentation and overview of my story and advocacy. Um, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So um, my twins, Micah and Zachary, were born at 27 weeks gestation. And like Amina and Lindsay, I had never heard of donor milk when they were born. I was told that if my milk didn't come in, that they would receive formula. And so it was, those were the two options I was given, formula or my milk. Um, and my milk didn't come in right away. And because I didn't know about donor milk, I didn't know to ask for it. Um, tragically, as you many of you know, Micah did die from complications of necrotized enterocolitis, and I was very fortunate to be able to donate his milk to Himbana Milk Banks um, and honor him in a really impactful and meaningful way um, that I ch really cherish. And after Micah died, I went back and I urged my NICU that where Micah and Zachary had received care to begin offering uh, pasteurized donor milk to infants in need. Um, and they weren't receptive to uh, our initial, my, the initial meetings that I had with them. And so I ended up going to the Detroit Free Press and I shared my story about how um, Micah developed neck and how he died and how um, this really potentially life-saving intervention was not accessible 
people to Micah or babies like him. And so they ran a couple of stories on it. And then finally, um, the Children's Hospital did implement donor milk coverage and um, access for these babies. And so the Detroit Free Press ran another article really highlighting how this really uh, life-saving intervention is now accessible for uh, babies like Micah, which is really wonderful and demonstrates the power of patient family stories and voices and how we can affect change. So just highlighting some really effective strategies, I think as others have said, the patient family voice is incredibly effective, powerful, and um, really motivates change. And so I encourage all of you, we all have stories to tell. Um, and so I encourage all of us to use our voices and share our stories. Um, media coverage is a very effective way to um, push legislators, to push children's hospitals, to push us all to do better for our babies in need. Um, also funding, of course, funding is very powerful. And I think that's um, demonstrated just how the next society has been able to be effective thanks to our generous community of donors and supporters who have made this work possible. We've been able to advocate for babies um, in need. Coordinating with other groups, just like the partnership that we have between the Next Society and Himbana, we are much more powerful to, when we work together and coordinate our efforts. And then always um, being authentic with our engagement, with our partnerships, and keeping babies and families centered in all that we do, and making sure that we are really being um, staying focused on our vision and our goals. So some specific ways that you all can get in, uh, involved in advocacy today, you can share your story. The Next Society is constantly highlighting the stories of patient families, clinicians, researchers. So if you have a story that you would be willing to share with us, we would love to highlight it. So you can reach out to us um, at any time. You can bring your community together, um, speak up and collaborate uh, in your community with your colleagues um, and meeting with your legislators. I know others have uh, spoken about the importance of this already, but I can't emphasize enough how important it is to reach out to your legislators to uh, help them understand the work that we are doing, uh, the importance of providing donor milk to babies at risk of neck. Uh, and then we hope you'll join us for our, our first Neck Advocacy Day that we plan to host in May of 2022. So stay tuned for that, where we're going to be meeting with um, legislators across the U.S. to advocate uh, for neck prevention efforts. We also have developed um, an advocacy info sheet. So you can find this on our website. Um, Lindsay might be able to share that link in the chat box if you're interested in checking this out, but this is a nice tool um, for when you're meeting with legislators and you do wanna talk to them about what is NAC and why is it important and why is this work so urgent, you can use this resource. And um, one more friendly reminder that another way that you can get involved is by donating at nextsociety.kindful.com to support the work that we're doing every day. So I'm really excited to open it up to a discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then all of our faculty can please turn on your cameras. Let me just uh, take a couple of seconds to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Shuttle Shah. I'm a neonatologist at the Maria Ferrer Children's Hospital. Uh, in New York, and uh, I did some of the work along with a whole host of partners uh, to make sure that um, babies born less than 1,500 grams in New York State uh, are eligible for Medicaid coverage of their donor milk while in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I just wanted to say, first of all, I wanted to thank all of the presenters, and I wanted to sort of use a little bit of the time <clears throat> to build a little bit on what people were saying. Um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about all of the different sort of perspectives that one can bring when advocating for donor milk. But when we talk about advocacy, it's really important to understand that <clears throat> advocacy really seizes the moment, right? Um, right now, we're going through, and, and, and that moment actually could be different based on where you live. So for example, my why in this, <clears throat> in uh, in donor milk advocacy really started because as a neonatologist, I was working at a state hospital that allowed mothers to purchase um, donor milk and use it for their infants. And I was on rounds one night, um, just walking around in the NICU late at night. And I noticed that there were two babies with the same exact gestational age, the same size, the same almost levels of disease, but one mother was able to purchase donor milk and one mother had to take three buses just to get to the hospital to visit her baby. And to me, that was just unacceptable, particularly in a state like New York. Um, so in New York State, <clears throat> the cost benefit was almost secondary. The messaging was almost exclusively built on the health equity proposition and the health perspective. Um, and that's just because like Tip O'Neill used to say, all politics are local. And that's something in New York State that tends to resonate that might not resonate in a state um, 
that currently doesn't have donor milk coverage. Those states might be more motivated by the value proposition um, and the cost effectiveness for donor milk, in which case you might decide to, to sort of hit a single and get donor milk covered for micro preemies because the value proposition is a little bit higher in terms of neck prevention than going for the home run and getting everyone in the NICU covered as well as all of the outpatients. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is really just give a shout out to the Next Society. The Next Society does a lot of great things, but to me, two of the biggest things that it does is it really brings together a coalition of people. We would not be on this call together, um, even though we're all working on the same, <laughs> on, on very similar things, if the Next Society didn't help bring us in under one tent. But that tent is actually very large when it comes to donor milk, right? <clears throat> in New York State, while the American Academy of Pediatrics and neonatologists really led this advocacy effort, we had the help of our nurse practitioners. We had the help of gynecologists and obstetricians who really understand this. We had the help of multiple um, patient advocacy groups, including the Next Society, the March of Dimes, um, groups of lactation consultants, mother's milk banks, uh, public hospitals. Um, all of them came together <clears throat> and really said that it's important for us to do this uh, for babies. And the other thing I wanted to just hammer home while we're waiting for questions is that what, what Jennifer said and what Denise said specifically are, is one of the most important take home messages, which is that, you know, neonatologists uh, and Allison showed this, you know, we're all addicted to PubMed. We love PubMed. We love the data, but, and the data is extremely important because it's, it's, it's highly favorable for, for coverage, but it's really the stories that make the facts stick. And to me, going to the legislature for several meetings and almost a year and a half, educating people about the facts behind donor milk was sort of important foundational work. But when it came time for people to actually vote on a budget that included this line item, it really was the army of mothers that rallied, mothers who had lost babies, mothers who had benefited from donor milk, uh, who came together and said that this is something that needs to be done for New York's children. Um, so we are waiting for a couple of questions. I'm going to start. There is one question here, um, and it's from Dr. Ravi Patel that said, could you speak on the efforts for national standards for donor milk coverage by Medicaid? And is this best led at the state level or a national level? Um, so I'm going to open that up to the entire group um, to see who wants to start us off on answering that question. I'll start and I'll kick it over to Denise who leads our legislative efforts at Himbana. Um, from what I've been told from experts that it is best to start at the state by state level, although it just seems like logically so much more effective to just, can't we just sweepingly get this, you know, changed? And I've been told that that is much harder to do. So it's a, it's a grueling, arduous process to go state by state. Um, Denise does a wonderful job um, as a volunteer leading our member milk banks in the states where they're located and the states at which they're near. And what we do is we take best practice for uh, uh, states like New York or California, for example, and we use those, what we like about those, and try to use those to advocate for states that don't have uh, laws at all or or improve those that are already on the books. Anything you'd add to that, Denise? Um, no, just that every state is completely different. Um, what works in one state doesn't work in another. There's different structures on how things are reimbursed. Some states are a DRG state, and that's very different than re other reimbursements. So state by state really is um, a good approach. Also, um, we're in very different um donor milk use is very different state to state. I mean, we see that here, as I had mentioned in my presentation, donor milk is relatively new to Pennsylvania. We only had 30 some percent of our hospitals in um, Pennsylvania before we opened our milk bank six years ago using donor milk. We are just now seeing an evolution where we're starting to get well baby use in, um, the, in the hospitals and more outpatient use where on the other side of the country, that's just been standard of care for a really long time. And so that's the other piece of it too, is that, um, you know, that it's very different in every state. And that also speaks to the question 
um, that I believe um, it was uh, that Becky had um, the question before asking, you know, why is it that there are some babies that are um, like a 35 weeker doesn't have um, donor milk or that there are some physicians that don't believe it's necessary for those larger babies. I, I see that ev that evolving in our own state as we all went to donor milk use in the NICUs and seeing what it can do and then expanding out. So everyone's just at a different place. And so that's, again, why it needs to be on the state level. But um, that's the only thing I would add. I may just jump in on some slightly tangential um topics that I do think promote one of the things that we know is that in hospitals that have high levels of mother's own milk, um, you know, there is increased, are more likely to use donor milk as well. Like donor milk sort of helps, um, helps increasing mother's own milk. And so I do think there is room for national policies that support mothers um, and that support families, um, things like uh, you know, improved uh, parental leave policies um, and things like that, that may not be directly related to donor milk coverage, but that are going to touch on families um, and facilitate um, sort of improvement in care. So I, I do think there is a role for, for some national work. Um, I probably am speaking a little bit um, beyond my knowledge, but the Women, Infant, and Children's or the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children's is obviously a national program. Um, and there may be is sort of some opportunities um, from that perspective as well. But there's so many unique things on the state level that perhaps from a national perspective, um, we should be looking at larger, more global policies that support families and support mothers. So I'm just going to little build a little bit on what people are saying. So first, uh, I think what what both Denise and Lindsay said is very true. That the the truism is that if you've seen one state Medicaid program, you've really seen only one state Medicaid program, um, and that's really because they are so uniquely individualized to what the what the states um, and what each particular states uh, need. Now that said. Um, each state is in of itself a laboratory for something that can go on potentially at the federal level. And one of, I think, the most interesting things that we've seen coming out of the current administration, and I'm going to, you know, this is a little bit of a, uh, you know, just sort of editorializing, is this willingness to sort of create incentives for states within policies. So, for example, for postpartum Medicaid uh, coverage to go up to a year, the federal government didn't do it, but the federal government strongly incentivized states to do it by paying a certain percentage of the cost if the states were to opt in. Um, so that might be one particular sort of maneuver at the federal level to try and bring states to the table, particularly the states that are going to be more motivated by the value proposition, because you're not only saving money by doing it, you might actually flip the curve into making money by doing it which you could allot to other aspects of your Medicaid program if the federal government were able to sort of create this, this sort of funding mechanism. Um, and I think we are seeing that happen more and more and more as the COVID pandemic has raised a lot of awareness about inequities that exist in access to healthcare. Um, with that, uh, there is a question. Um, what can we expect to hear from policymakers who are reluctant or against coverage for donor human milk. So for those of you who have been in legislative offices, uh, what have you heard uh, from, from the legislators who aren't as receptive to donor milk? Um, I would just say, so our experience um, in Georgia recently has not actually been that they aren't necessarily receptive. Um, I think there is, um, it is very compelling to talk about um, an intervention that saves the lives of infants. Um, I also think that it's something that reaches across the political aisle. Um, we've had folks from both sides, from both political parties who, who are interested um, in, this, in this cause. Um, some of the challenges and hurdles comes um, with how donor milk is um, 
regulated or classified or lack thereof um, as sort of is it a food? Is it not a food? Is it a medicine? Is it, is it a tissue? Um, and so some of the nuances there vary by state um, in terms of how, um, you know, how that, that may be received and approached. But from a overall global sort of picture of support of donor human milk, um, the main opposition is not in, you know, to the idea itself, but maybe related to cost um, or sort of, um, specific logistics or regulations. If I can add on what Allison has said, and our experience in Ohio has been very similar in that um, people want to help babies and people want to help families. And so the reluctance isn't, there's not a reluctance for donor milk or to, to create a pathway for donor milk but there can be a lot of administrative barriers. There can be logistical details to work through. Every state is different. Every hospital is different in how they bill for things. And so sometimes it really is just slogging through the paperwork and trying to create a pathway. And fortunately, we have had states now that have found uh, ways to, to get to that outcome, to get to that goal um, and have created really nice model language and uh, billing structures. And I think that's why it's really important too to, to build a network, to know who all your stakeholders are and who you can reach out to, to help you navigate some of these issues. I think Allison said, like, I'm not a financial expert. I am not a hospital biller or coder, you know, and that's not my area of expertise, but I am passionate about this issue. And so creating it, those relationships and finding the people that can help with that can really help, um, again, not address reluctance for donor milk, but some of the other types of barriers that exist. Um, another um, point that seems to resonate with the legislators quite a bit is that, you know, when we are discussing donor milk, we're very much focused on the that acute hospital stay, what it means for cost savings in that first year. But the reality is that neck can have huge implications for a lifetime. And so, you know, it's not we do what we do, not just for that baby, but also for that child that that baby will grow into and that adult that baby will grow into. And the state is in a unique position where um, it basically owns and needs to pay for that long-term outcome that the health plans aren't because they're worried about just that one moment in time. And that family may choose a different health plan next year. So, you know, they're worried about right now, but the state really is the owner of that, um, of the outcome all the way through and um, all the implications that it comes for caring for an older child and caring for educational needs and all of that. And that seems to be something that resonates quite a bit with the legislators. They really understand that, you know, long-term impact. And they're interested in, in, in that from a financial standpoint. Yeah, I'll just add on. I think what both Allison and Denise said is completely correct. No, no, <laughs> no legislator who wants to get reelected is going to be like, I'm against babies. I mean, like that just, you know, that that that's a, it's just not something that's going to hear that you're going to hear. Um, what you the biggest opposition we had in New York, other than the first few years we spent just generally educating the legislature about this is apathy. Um while everyone cares about babies, the number of babies, particularly the micro premature babies um, that see the greatest value from a dollars and cents standpoint and from a prevention of necrotizing and or colitis standpoint um, relative to all babies and all children and all of the other constituencies that a legislator has to deal with is, uh, uh, is relatively small. And even though we're walking in there very confident in what the cost savings numbers can be or should be, um, in the context of billions of dollars in a Medicaid budget, we still are, while, while it's cost savings, it's still, you know, a rounding error um, when one looks at the overall aspect of the state Medicaid budget. So in that sense, it's sometimes easier for legislators who aren't going to sort of champion this issue to look towards other things that are trying to captivate their attention. So the, I think the goal here is to be persistent and to keep people's focus on on the infants and on the children. 
and to um, share those stories, right? Because absolutely. that's where you can really capture the hearts. It's like, right, we might not be able to capture them perhaps with the numbers, but when you hear a story that they will never forget and that is tragic and devastating and inspiring and motivating and beautiful, then they might actually be willing to champion this issue. So I think it's really critical that we elevate those voices and the stories and we bring our patient families forward to help them share. And speaking of, I know there's a question I think from Becky on around like, how do we educate families about donor milk? Um, and so Amina, feel free to jump in. I, one thing I wanna share is, um, cause I, again, like Lindsay and Amina, I had no idea that donor milk existed before uh, I was in the NICU, well into the NICU, I should say. I was probably in the NICU for like six weeks before I found it on my own <laughs> that donor milk was a thing. And so one thing I think we can do, obviously we all need to work on informing patients and families much earlier that donor milk is an inter Prevention that they should ask for and that they should have access to. But even in communities, you know, the Mother's Milk Bank of North Texas does a really good job of um, just normalizing donor milk in their communities. I remember seeing billboards about donor milk in their community. And so that families that didn't have any experience in the NICU, they would see these billboards in their community and they would learn what donor milk was about and how it was a life-saving intervention. So I think that that's one thing that comes to mind is just normalizing the conversation around donor milk talking about donor milk as though we talk about blood donations, you know, blood, blood donations um, are a life-saving intervention that everyone has access to. And that's the same thing as it should be for donor milk and for our infants. So um, that, and Amina, feel free to, because I know that this particular question was directed to you. So I'm not sure yeah, I was you just add. going to say that um, I think moms and parents generally want to do what's best for their babies, but they need the information to know what's best for their babies to make an informed decision. So I think what um, the people that really played a huge role in my educational donor milk were the nurses. I even met with a neonatologist prior to giving birth to McKenna. And while he mentioned a lot of other things, including TPN, he did not tell me anything about donor milk. So maybe during pregnancy, when women are, um, you know, having their prenatal appointments, I think that would be a great opportunity to mention it. Um, and additionally, like after McKenna passed, and I, I had another baby and um, just speaking also to moms who do not have like babies at risk for, you know, anything or NICU babies, they are pumping and produce extra milk. And even like a lot of my friends that have healthy babies at um, 40 weeks, they didn't know about donor milk. So I encourage them to, if they have excess milk to donate that. So um, focusing on other communities outside of communities with uh, medically fragile infants. Absolutely. Denise, really quick, do you want to cover CPT codes, uh, just really what it is? I know we're over, so we have to make it brief, but I, I'm not sure that everyone knows what a CPT code is in, in the chat box there. Oh, sure. So um, Pauline from uh, the San Jose Milk Bank had, um, had uh, mentioned about talking about codes. So, um, you know, uh, procedural codes, um, the, you know, coding is an art and a science, right? To be able to get reimbursed, it's one thing having coverage, but then another thing, you know, the logistics of, of actually getting reimbursed and such. And there's a lot of different work and a lot of different things that go into making donor milk happen, whether it's on the um, prescriber side and our side and such. And so, um, you know, really um, what's important to um, be able to, to be able to bill and get reimbursed for donor milk is having proper codes. So we do have um, a, a temporary HIP, HIC, HIC code. It's been temporary since the 1980s. <laughs> so we're still working off a temporary code for um, donor milk and um, on the Medicaid side, and then um, having a CPT code um, would um, would basically help legitimize donor milk, help facilitate its billing. Um, it's something that we had um, started um, to do uh, with Habana, um, having an application to the American, uh, to the AMA, um, to create uh, codes specific to donor milk. And that's something that the AAP has now decided to help us and to actually take over that application. So that's something that's um, in the works. And um, it just is part of the whole package of making this something that's covered and billable and having that whole system work well. Excellent, thank you. All right, are we, any other questions before I move us to our closing slides? 
Fantastic. All right. I just have a couple, I think, more to share. One, I just wanted to remind everyone that we have one more of our summer webinars taking place on August 20th on advancing equity for babies and mothers. So we hope you'll join us for that. And I should mention that the recording of our Elevating Nurses webinar that took place on June 22nd is now on our website. So you can find that at nexusid.org and the recording of this presentation will be available soon as well. So thank you so much for um, joining us and we hope to see you again. If you have uh, time to share your thoughts, we would love to um, hear from you. So I'm going to launch this quick poll on uh, what you thought about today's webinar. And thank you. We hope to see you on August 20th. Take care, everybody.